Welcome to the Da Vinci Hour podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Maxwell Cooper, and in this podcast series, I interview physicians, medical innovators, and entrepreneurs making an impact on healthcare. This podcast is produced by Da Vinci Academy, a multimedia medical education company that provides podcasts, video courses, and digital textbooks. You can see more on our website, www.dviacademy.com and our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash C slash Da Vinci Academy Med. Hey everybody, welcome back to the Da Vinci Hour podcast. I'm honored this week to be joined by Dr. Ricardo Comatar from the University of Miami, uh, professor of neurosurgery and residency program director and the director of the Brain Tumor Center at University of Miami. Thanks for joining us, really appreciate it. Absolutely, man, thanks for having me, it's a pleasure. Awesome. So maybe tell us a little bit about your, your education, your training, and kind of maybe a general overview of your clinical practice and some of the other uh, interesting endeavors you're working on as well. Sure. Um, I guess I'll try to keep it brief. I was born in New York, grew up in New York and New Jersey, went to uh, college at Duke University and then medical school at Johns Hopkins, followed by residency training at Columbia uh, University, and then a fellowship in brain tumors at Sloan Kettering. Came down here to Miami about a decade ago uh, with the goal of building a brain tumor center. It's been 10 years and um, we've done a terrific job here. I think that our center is one of the you know, premier in the country. Also lead the residency program, which is another uh, point of pride for me. Our residents are absolutely phenomenal. It's the best part of our program. And every year we get three of the best applicants in the country. So uh, truly a pleasure. It's right time, right place, which is the way most success happens. Awesome. So your clinical practice and, and your, I imagine your research interest as well is primarily uh, with neuro-oncology and brain, brain tumor surgery? Yeah, correct. 100% of my practice is brain tumors, uh, a combination of benign tumors, non-cancerous, meaning meningiomas uh, and pituitary tumors, as well as a fair share of cancer, uh, gliomas and metastases. So I'm curious, how, how do you balance being, you know, residency program director could be Obviously, as you know, to all too well, a full-time job with all the responsibilities there, being a very active, high volume surgeon, being an active researcher, you know, and then obviously the other things you're involved in. How how do you balance all these different things that you're doing? <laughs> That's a good question. I, you know, I think you have to be able to multitask very efficiently. Uh, and you have to have a very wide bandwidth. I always tell people that I feel like in this day and age, what What is the best predictor of someone's success is their bandwidth. If someone is very good at one thing and one thing only, that's great, but that's going to limit you uh, in this day and age, especially where the transfer of information is so fast, so rapid, everything. I mean, I'm sure you know it. I mean, the number of emails you get a day is in the hundreds. The number of texts you get is in the hundred. And if you're not able to have a wide bandwidth, and by that, I mean, able to operate, able to know what's going on with the residents, able to handle all the emails and the high throughput of information that goes on regarding research and mentorship, then you're going to limit your success. And so rather than being a one trick pony, I would say that my advice to people who are aspiring to be physicians is you got to be able to multitask and handle many different things at one time and push all of those forward. That's something I feel like is a real strong suit of mine. Uh, that's how I've been able to do those things kind of, uh, simultaneously and not, not have the quality suffer. Definitely. And I, I think as we were talking before we you know, started recording, it's also, th- I imagine many of these things you do are things you're very passionate about. You love doing there. I mean, obviously every job has its things you don't want to do, but you know, like this podcast that I do and your podcast, it's, it's things we enjoy doing. I think that probably makes it a little bit easier. I, I would imagine you would agree. hundred <laughs> percent. I think that if you look at anyone who achieves success or let's say greatness in any field, whether it's medicine or law or business or sports or what have you, they have to be passionate about it. If you don't love what you do, your your, your ceiling is really limited because you're not going to put in the extra effort. And just like you said, I, I love what I do, uh, everything from the clinical part with the surgery in combination with the residents, which is a true passion of mine, the research, the podcast, And I I was lucky that I knew what I wanted to do at a very early age. I think that's also another predictor of success. The people who it takes them a while to figure out what they want to do, they they finish college and then they do a post back or they do law school and then they quit. Less likely to be successful, I think, 
than if someone knows what they want to do early on. I, I, knew I wanted to do uh, brain surgery since ninth grade. That kind of made the entire process much easier because uh, you know what you want to do. You're focused. You know what you're going to spend your free time on, what your research, what your summers are going to be on. And the earlier you're focused, I feel like the easier it is to be successful. So I think passion, commitment, sacrifice, these are all things that, in my opinion, are, are more important than just intellectual talent. Interesting. Yeah, d- definitely agree with that. I'm curious, you know, as, especially as an academic surgeon, you know, I'm sure you've heard and I, I've heard people say, well, you're a busy researcher, you can't be a good clinician. Or if, you know, you're a busy clinician, you don't have time for research. Not, I'm curious, what, what are your thoughts on, on when people say that? <laughs> I mean, it's the old statement that if you want something done as someone who's busy, I feel like you definitely can do all of them with the, with the caveat being that you have to love doing it and you have to be able to multitask. Some people are just unable to multitask. They're excellent at just surgery or they're excellent at just research or just mentorship. And that's great. There's definitely a role for those people, but you can definitely do all three if it's a passion and you're driven and you're focused and it's something you love, you can definitely do all three. Excellent. You know, I've noticed from your, your podcast, the, the crossover that you talk with a lot of guests about, you know, medicine and obviously a lot of a, a wide variety of topics beyond that, but also health and wellness and, you know, keeping yourself, you know, mentally fit, physically fit, taking care of yourself, a healthy lifestyle. I'm curious, how do you incorporate that into, you know, your life and, and your busy practice? And then you know, as a residency program director, I'm curious how you advise the, the residents with such a demanding schedule, how they, uh, how you recommend them incorporate that as well. So I, I think it's a lifestyle perspective. And I think that the moment you realize that your lifestyle, what you eat, how you sleep, your exercise, all affects your mind and body. And if you're going to maximize whatever you're doing, again, it could be medicine, law, business, sports, doesn't matter. If you're going to be as efficient and as productive and as successful as you can possibly be, that requires you to take care of your body. And a big reason why I, I have the energy that I do and I'm able to do what I do is that I sleep right, I eat right, and I work out. And I, I can't emphasize that enough. And you know, people say, well, how do you have time to work out? You don't give yourself an option, right? Like you don't give yourself an option to not brush your teeth. That's just part of your day. It's there. You're going to brush your teeth. You don't give yourself an option of not working out. You don't give yourself the option of not eating right. You don't give yourself the option of not sleeping right. And I think if you take care of yourself in those three elements, your overall wellness, your stress level, all that stuff is so much more manageable if you do those three things, because every job is going to have stress. Every job is going to have demands on your mind and your body and stuff. And if you can eat the right foods, sleep the right amount and work out. It makes, it makes everything much easier. And that's something that I always tell the residents. And, and obviously you can't force people to do anything, but I feel like I lead by example and they see that and, and it's just an example for them to, to follow. Yeah. I think that's, that's excellent advice. There's, there's another physician I had on uh, Todd Hanna, who's, who's an oral maxillofacial surgeon that's big on Instagram and, and he's very into fitness as well. And, and he said something kind of similar that, you know, it's, you have to like, be at the end of the day, if you didn't work out, you don't feel right. You know, just like you said, if you didn't brush your teeth or if you didn't eat dinner or, you know, it has to be, I think that's a great point. It has to be basically part of your routine. It has to be a priority to you. Otherwise, you know, it won't, it won't happen. (laughs) Yeah. I mean, it's about not having excuses. And that's another thing that I always preach to our residents and our fellows is if you're okay with excuses, you can make an excuse for anything at any time. Oh, I didn't feel this. You can always have an excuse for everything you know, during your day, whether it's work or diet or sleep or, you know, exercise, just don't give yourself a chance to make excuses. If you say you're going to do something, you do it. You don't give yourself an excuse. You don't allow excuses. And I think holding yourself to that standard and not allowing yourself to fall back because we all look, we all wake up in the morning. We all have the same challenges. We all go through the same stresses and what separates different people's success and how happy they are. It's not that they don't have different, we all have the same challenges. It's how you, how you handle those challenges, how you handle the stress and what's your perspective. So that's what ultimately determines your happiness and your success. I think that's great, great advice. Great advice. I mean, it's, uh, 
it's not just being good clinically and, and obviously that's, you know, paramount, but also making sure that you're, you know, fit enough to be good clinically as well. Cause you know, it's, you know, it's a very demanding job, you know, your job, obviously you're, you're on your feet all the day, you know, in IR, you know, we have lead on, we're, you know, standing a lot as well. And so it's, it's physically, it's physically demanding. So <laughs> it's, uh, it's both important mentally and then also physically to be, be fit for sure. Absolutely. I want to segue a little bit to, you know, something that you're very passionate about. I know you wrote a book about it. You, I know you give a lot of lectures across the country about it, which is, you know, practice building. And I think, which is really interesting. And, you know, in this day and age with trying to, you know, make an, you know, make your own practice and kind of, you know, build on service lines and things like that. Number one, you know, obviously you've built a very high volume practice uh, there in Miami for brain tumors. Why is, I guess, why is it important to build a high volume practice is my first question. And then kind of a follow up to that. How do you, you know, how do you do that? How do you build the high volume practice? <laughs> so your first question, why build a high volume practice? I, I would say that, and I didn't understand this back when I was a resident. I, I think that when you become an attending and you're managing your own patients or you're leading a division or you're a chairman or what have you at any level, you very quickly realize that volume is power. And that's a very, it's a, it's a very important statement. Volume is power because really volume is where every other academic success comes from. So volume is going to be expertise. So if you do a lot of surgeries, you're going to become inherently better at those surgeries, just like playing the sport. So it helps you master whatever technical skill you are learning. Volume is going to be teaching. So if you want to train the next generation of future leaders, you need to have high volume. So your residents and fellows see this on a day-to-day -day basis as opposed to once a month. Volume is going to be research, right? If you're going to do research and you're going to publish, you don't want to be doing one surgery a week. You just can't generate enough data to publish and make a real difference. If you're doing a thousand brain tumors a year, that's when you can really come up with, with, with novel techniques, novel therapies, and true data analysis. And then finally, volume is going to be reputation. It's going to be how people know you, how they respect your program. That's what we've done here. And actually, most importantly, volume is going to give you leverage in the institution. Uh, I think a lot of junior surgeons get to their first job and they have a lot of asks. I need support. I need better office space. I need more OR time. I need more clinic time. But if you're not producing, these, these hospitals aren't going to give you what you want because they have a lot of asks. So at the end of the day, if you're producing volume, you control that referral base. You control that revenue stream for the hospital. And at the end of the day, you have more leverage when you're dealing with the hospital and trying to negotiate for more OR time, ancillary staff, clinic space, office space, whatever it's going to be. No, I think that makes a lot of sense. I mean, it's it's similar, I guess you could think to, you know, law firms or consulting firms or those where, you know, the people who bill the most hours or work the most hours or, you know, probably have, you know, more saying it just makes sense. I mean, at the end of the day, medicine's a business. At the end of the day, you've got to generate revenue for the hospital. You got to keep the lights on. So I would imagine... And I imagine when you go to it, when you do go to administration for those asks, when you were starting out and building your practices, you've got more volume, you probably noticed that they listen to you more when you, you know, could back it up with the numbers. Yeah. I mean, medicine is a business and what you just said is absolutely right. I think no one talks about that. No one focuses on it. It's never taught during medical school, certainly not taught during residency yet. It's probably one of the most important aspects to your success, which is kind of crazy. You can go through, at least in neurosurgery, you can go through four years of medical school, seven years of residency, and one to two years of fellowship, and never be taught the most important successful variable in your career, which is the business of medicine, how to build a practice. People think that you're just going to hang up your shingle and say, I'm Dr. So-and-so, and I'm a surgeon. No one's going to come to you. You have to understand all the variables that drive referral patterns. That's a whole nother topic. But the moment you understand what drives referrals and it, very little of it has to do with the quality of doctorship. It's there's so many other variables. And once you understand the business aspect, then you can focus on those and you can build your practice efficiently. Yeah. I think that's an excellent point. I mean, some entrepreneurs I've talked to kind of say the same thing in the startup world where you could have the greatest product in the world, but if you're not out there networking, you know, promoting it, making the right connections, you know, no one's going to buy it. No one's going to invest in your company. So I'm curious from, your perspective, how, what is the best way for, because I, th I would imagine a lot of physicians, especially if they go into academia, they think, oh, well, the, the referral base is built in and, you know, I, I don't have to do much, you know, people will know who I am. What's, I guess, how, how have you been able to, you know, 
get those referrals, you know, build that referral network uh, for your program? I would say three factors in order of importance. Number one, access. Access is everything. And I'll go into that in just a bit. Number two is communication. And number three is providing excellent quality care. Now you would think that that last factor would be the most important. It's actually the least important. Um, Number one is access. And by that, I mean that referrals are going to go the path of least resistance. So you could be the world's best surgeon, but if it's impossible to get to you, meaning it's some central scheduling, they answer the phone, your next appointments in six months, what have you, people are not going to refer patients to you, even though you're the world's best surgeon. They don't care. Access literally is everything. If you make it easy for patients to see you and easy for doctors to send you patients, you will be busy off the bat, just that alone. Number two is communication. If you are available and you communicate via, and not by fax, fax in this day and age is completely irrelevant. They should just ban faxes. But if you can email, text, phone calls, and be in touch with doctors, it makes you human and it makes you accessible. And that's going to also build your practice because you're going to have better patient care and you close the loop and there's continuity of care. And then the last thing is how good you are as a surgeon and providing excellent quality care. So if you're in academia, for the most part, those are well vetted out surgeons. There is quality assurance. So for the most part, those are, those are going to be high quality surgeons. Now you just got to attack the other two things. Now you just got to work on access and your communication. And then when you have all three, that's when you can really dominate. That's awesome. You know, I think, I think that's a great point about availability. I mean, I think probably maybe some surgeons or some physicians in general, just let their, maybe let their ego get the better of them a little bit in that regard and think, oh, well, you know, they should talk to my secretary or they should, you know, talk to my office or whatever. And I think that's a good point you make about, you know, especially when you're dealing, you know, peer to peer, physician to physician, you know, making yourself available. I, I was talking with one of the IR faculty about this and he was telling me about a recent graduate of ours who went out and, you know, he gave his cell phone out to all the hospitalists and the ER docs and said, you know, when these different types of you know, people with vertebral compression fractures, you know, that would need benefit from a kyphoplasty or something like that, you know, give me a call directly on my cell phone. And he built a service line that way. And I think, you know, what you're saying is so true from what I've heard from others as well. Yeah, you absolutely have to put the work in. And it's, it's like, it's like everything else, you got to put the work in. If you build barriers around yourself, because you don't want your phone ringing, you don't want to get emails, you want to have a cush lifestyle and put these barriers around you, Your practice will never be what it could be. Um, So you got to put in the work. You got to put in the sacrifice. You got to, you you have to be available. And yeah, sometimes you get a text or a phone call and you don't feel like answering that phone. I'll tell you, it's hundred percent happens. But at the end of the day, you got to answer that phone because you only have one chance to say no. The moment you tell someone no, or you don't answer your phone, you've, you've lost that, that referral base. They're going to go elsewhere. And so you always have to have the perspective of put your shoes or put yourself in the shoes of the referring doctor. Think to yourself, if you were that referring doctor, what would you want? You would want the ability to send patients at a moment's notice to a specialist who's going to take good care of their patients and let you know how they're doing. So if you can provide access, communication, and high quality care, then it's game over. That's awesome. One thing I've noticed that you, you know, from I think one of the speeches you gave on YouTube that I watched it, you know, you came to Miami to build a practice or to build the brain tumor center there. And I remember you talking something about building, you know, not just within your own institution, but the, a referral network kind of within the region. I'm curious, you know, how, how were you able to do that both probably in the Miami area? And then I'm sure you've reached out even beyond that and kind of, you know, South Florida and beyond. It's a grassroots effort, right? So I think that whenever someone is looking to build a practice, build a program, build a reputation locally, nationally, internationally. It sounds very daunting and it is a lot of work. My recommendation would be it starts grassroots. It starts locally. It's with those three things I said, access, communication, high quality care. Your patients will end up being your biggest referral source. And those doctors who are in incredibly pleased with your care. We'll tell other doctors. So what we've done here at Miami is we started promoting locally, meaning giving talks at every single hospital locally. But then once you hit a critical mass in terms of your referral base, your patients become your biggest referral source. Never lose sight of that, is that in this day and age with social media, 
everyone knows someone who knows someone who had neurosurgery. So your patients, if they are happy with the care they got and the doctor's happy with the care you gave, they will tell everyone, Hey, I had this surgery with so-and-so and their friends will know, and they'll go talk about you. So that starts locally. It eventually starts to grow into a statewide reputation, then national and then international. So there's no secret to it other than hard work, dedication, sacrifice, staying focused, and you got to provide excellent patient care. And that just, that take, that goes in a stepwise fashion and it grows. Another thing that, you know, we, we talked about is, you know, you're very active in research. So I, I guess first is that what, what types of research are you, are you very active in? And then how did you build, you know, as you know, that's involves a lot of infrastructure to really get, you know, to where you're producing, you know, consistently a, a, a high number of papers and quality papers uh, for the literature. I guess, how have you built that in, you know, to, and then how has that benefited you building your practice as well? So I don't know if it's directly affected me building my practice. I can tell you that the number one key to success for me in terms of the research is surrounding myself with amazing people. And in particular, Mike Ivan, who directs the UMBTI brain tumor research and Ashish Shah, who we just brought on, who directs all of our clinical trials. If you surround yourself with people that are better than you in certain aspects, the entire team goes up. So that's a big point for anyone trying to build a program. You can't be the best in everything. You can be great at everything, but surround yourself with people who do certain things better than you. And everyone kind of has their own niche. And if you surround yourself with people that push you and challenge you and are better than you at certain things, the entire program elevates. And so for me, when it comes to research, I've been lucky to really surround myself with the right people uh, who are dedicated to research. And then as a team, we've been ultra productive. Our research focuses mainly on gliomas and malignancies. A lot of clinical trials, especially now that we have a shisha in terms of surgical clinical trials, looking at new therapies for glioblastomas, that's, that's what we're focused on. That's awesome. Interesting. Have you incorporated some basic science lab into that or, or uh, you know, collaborate with the pathology department in that as well? Because I imagine you have probably a lot of, you know, being a high volume center, that's another benefit is you have a lot of, you know, tissue uh, that you can do research on as well. Absolutely. I, I think as a surgeon, uh, a lot of people say, well, as a surgeon, you can't really do basic science. And I think that you can, but just like you referenced, it's about the tissue. Tissue is one of the most valuable commodities in research because that's where a lot of the translational research comes from. So as a high volume center, again, we do a combined over 1300 brain tumor surgeries that allows us to collaborate with multiple basic scientists who are dedicated to just basic science. Um, so yes, we have a very high volume tissue bank. It's one of the largest in the country. And we collaborate with many basic scientists who utilize that tissue for their own basic science research. And then we obviously work together on putting the final product together. That's awesome. It's amazing what you're, what you've built down there. It's uh, I'm in awe of what you guys do. I mean, it's really the full package. It's amazing. One, one other thing I wanted to ask you about is, uh, you know, social media, you know, as, and you've referenced, you kind of referenced this earlier in the discussion is, is kind of what role do you think that plays in one kind of, you know, marketing yourself, talking about your work, but then also helping you get, you know, known, you know, not just maybe just to be famous, but more so to like, you know, where patients know who you are, they know what kind of work you do and things like that. Social media 10 years ago was an option. It was something that was done by teenagers, wasn't really professional and you could take it or leave it really depending upon personal preference. In this day and age, social media is mandatory for anyone who's younger than 60, I would say in any profession, business, law, medicine, doesn't matter. So think about it this way. When someone gets referred to you uh, in, again, any profession, they're going to number one, Google you. They're going to check out what's online about you. And in, Everyone has Instagram, everyone does Facebook, everyone does Twitter. Your social media presence carries a lot of weight. And so if you're an amazing surgeon or you're an amazing lawyer or you're an amazing businessman or businesswoman and your social media presence or your online presence, let's make it more general, does not adequately reflect the type of professional you are, how are people going to know, right? I, I, I say that shopping for a doctor is like shopping for a wine for most people. 
I don't know anything about wines. I pick wines based off how nice they look and how nice the bottle looks, but I, I don't actually know how good the wine is. Most patients don't know what makes a good doctor. They're going to look online. And if it says Joe Schmo neurosurgeon and no other description, they don't know how good you are. But if you put in there all the clinical trials that you're doing, all the, all the new techniques that you're doing, all the uh, platform talks that you've given at all the major uh, conferences, that carries a lot of weight. And so social media and online presence in general is your way to market yourself. And people may not want to market themselves. I get it. And you don't have to market yourself, but it's going to limit you in terms of growth. I tell all our residents when they start here, they should, they should begin a professional social media account of some sort. It can be Twitter. It can be Facebook. It can be Instagram. It can be more than just one, but they need at least one because you're going to need that. And patients are going to look for that. And if you do a cool case and you have a great outcome, post it. If you have a great patient outcome of someone who's super grateful, get a testimonial. All that stuff carries weight because Otherwise, how do future patients know about what you're doing? You have to put it out there. Yeah, no, I think that's a great point is, you know, you have to just having your credentials listed on a hospital website probably isn't enough anymore. It's, it's more, you know, pe- patients want to know who their doctor is, you know, for better or worse. <laughs> um, so they want to see what you're doing, what you're passionate about. And um, that could even, like you said, that could even just be, you know, cases that you've done that have been, you know, had an impact and things like that. Um, I guess going off that, you know, we talked about, obviously you're the host of the crossover podcast, maybe tell us about how you got started doing that. What's kind of been your, your goal and you know, who, who's kind of your main audience with that. So it started out as strictly a hobby when I was bored during the beginning of COVID, uh, during the pandemic in 2020, kind of March, April, May, when elective surgeries were slowed down, the hospitals slowed down. It just started as a simple conversation with local physicians on Instagram Live. Very quickly, I enjoyed doing it. And like we talked about earlier, if you enjoy something and it's a passion, it's very easy to devote yourself to it. So I really got into it. I, I, I've had the, the, the luxury of interviewing a lot of very high profile, uh, interesting individuals who have taught me a lot. And so it grew from just a a simple conversation with local physicians and very quickly it became uh, a formal podcast with a lot of amazing individuals who, who I've learned a lot from. Thanks uh, a lot to my colleague, uh, Rob Taglarini, who's the executive producer who basically put the podcast together. I mean, when he heard about it, he turned it into a professional podcast. And then from there, things have really exploded. So right time, right place, something you're passionate about, you make time for it if it's something that's important to you. And much like your podcast, I feel like it's a learning opportunity. Every week I get to speak to world leaders or world experts in whatever topic I choose. And I get them for half an hour and I can ask them anything I want. That's, that's an incredible opportunity. So I don't, I don't take that for granted. No, I would echo a lot of what you're saying. It's been an incredible, for me, it's been an incredible networking. And I learned, like you said, I learned something, I mean, you know, even our discussion right now, even though we're different fields, you know, everything you're talking about with practice building that can translate over, you know, to a lot of other fields, you know, especially any procedural based field as well. So um, I would echo and you and you get to meet people that you probably otherwise wouldn't get to, at least in my shoes, (laughs) be able able to meet. I'm I'm curious, how do you get some of your guests? you, You know, like you said, you've had some incredibly high profile people. Do you it just tapping into your network or just kind of reaching out to them and seeing if they're interested or. Yeah, it's a lot of work. <laughs> just like, I mean, I'm talking to you and you've basically done the exact same thing. You have amazing guests on your podcast. It's you got to identify people that have a cause, something that they're going to want to talk about. And then once you find what, what kind of inspires these people, then getting in touch with them is the, is probably the hardest thing to do. You have to have an end especially for very high profile people, they have so many barriers, so many layers to get to them. So typically it's word of mouth. I will know someone who knows someone who knows someone and I kind of work back door. Other times it's just multiple phone calls. You, there's someone who I really want to interview who I think has a great message to kind of tell people and I'll call their office and I'll call their office and I'll just, I won't take no for an answer. And you eventually get to them and Sometimes they say no, and you got to be okay with, with them saying no, and that's, that's part of the process. But as long as you're trying and you've identified people, 
And then just like patient referrals, once you hit a critical mass, these guests become easier. Once you land a few high profile guests, when you ask new potential guests, they see, wow, you've interviewed A, B, C, and D. I want to be on that podcast because people think that that's, it's clearly a very legit podcast if you're getting high profile people. So it's a lot of work early on. Once you kind of generate a reputation, it's easier to get new people on. That's awesome. Yeah, I, I would agree with that. I think it's something I started out doing kind of like yourself, where I honestly, I think the first 10 guests were just friends of mine that I went to medical school with or knew from residency and um, or attendings I had worked with uh, and, and admired. And so, and it's kind of blossomed into this, you know, uh, endeavor where I'm, you know, beating all these different people. And a lot of most of the podcast guests I have now are people I you know, haven't met previously. And so it's, it's amazing who will say yes, you know, it's, it's, uh, you'd be surprised. It's uh, some people, it's just cold emailing them. And then, and then also, like you said, you also, you know, sometimes, you know, that's the way it goes. Sometimes people that you would think say yes, don't, and that's kind of the way it goes, but <laughs> Who works on your website? Because your website looks great. And I think that's another huge component. If you're going to have a podcast, if you're going to be successful, it, it has to look professional. And you can have a great podcast, but it can it can look terrible. Your podcast, your website looks terrific. You've had great guests on. Do you do your own website and all that audio visual? Yes, yeah, so I do a lot of the like, you know, scheduling guests and recording and stuff, but my brothers are my kind of business partners in this endeavor and then some of the video courses that we've done in the past too. And so they help with kind of build, putting the website together. And we use this website management system that helps us called Kajabi. That's makes it very easy. I mean, even me, I have very limited computer skills as far as that goes. And I'm able to update the website pretty easily with that. So that's, that's how we've been able to do that. Well, it looks great. It looks great. Congrats. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate that. As we close out here, the other thing I wanted to ask you about and we talked a little bit about this, but I ask every guest this is, uh, what do you, when you're not working, what, what are your passions outside of work and how do you, how do you find that balance if you can? <laughs> yeah. Um, I think it's about efficiency and it's about doing things you love, staying fit, traveling, uh, taking care of family, all that stuff. I think that maintaining efficiency and maintaining priorities, I think that's big, right? Because no matter who you are and what you're doing, you have to maintain priorities. You can't be everything to everyone. And so I think knowing what your priorities are, whether it's family, fitness, traveling, watching football, what, as something as simple as that, knowing what your priorities are and staying true to those, I think makes your free time a lot more valuable. The other thing is people will get asked to do a lot of things. We all get asked to give talks or go to different meetings. And I think that very quickly you realize unless something is a, is a hell yeah, you say no, because you'll get an email. Hey, can you give this talk on this Saturday at this conference? And then you'll say yes. And then it comes to the Friday before the conference. And you're like, why did I sign up for this crap? And because you want to do something else, you want to do something with family or what have you. So I, I've learned that when you get a lot of requests to be involved in stuff, Unless it's something that you are super excited about, I say no, because when the time comes, you're not going to want to do it. No, I think that's a, that's an excellent point. I mean, as I'm sure, I'm sure at your state, at your level, you get offered, I probably almost every day you probably get offered things, you know, different, you know, either new opportunities or talks. And I think, you know, prior tracing what you're, what's important to you. I think that that makes, definitely makes a lot of sense because you only have so much to give. Well, I want to say thanks again for, you know, taking time out of your incredibly busy schedule to do this podcast. I'm honored you, that you joined us. I guess the last part, how can people find you? What's, you know, your social media, you know, obviously the podcast where they can find that. We'll, we'll you know, provide links and everything in the description, but just so people can hear it too. Yeah. Uh, so the podcast is www.thecrossoverpod.com. Very simple. Uh, and then my Instagram account is at Ricardo Comitar, my name. And then I have a website, which is uh, ricardocomitar.com that has pretty much everything. And again, you know, really appreciate you having me on. You, you really have a terrific podcast. I feel like you and I are living parallel lives. We have very, very similar podcasts at the same stages. And I definitely get a lot of inspiration from your podcast. So congrats on all your accomplishments. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Komitar. I really appreciate that. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Da Vinci Hour podcast presented by 
DaVinci Academy. Please be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel and follow the podcast on your podcast platform of choice to catch the latest episodes. Please leave a comment or a review and share it with a friend. Lastly, you can find all of our podcasts, video courses, and books on our website, dviacademy.com. Thank you for listening.